Hi, so my name's uh, Oliver Wildersmith. Um, this is Joe, Dakota, and Yi, and uh, together we've been working on an app called Social Lens this semester, and we're really excited to get to tell you about it today, and I appreciate uh, your taking the time to hear it on this busy time of the semester, and we look forward to your feedback. So Social Lens is a uh, social scavenger hunt game designed for children with autism. It uses Google Glass and a web-based system for managing and tracking social skill development over time. And before I get into that uh, and the details, I want to tell you a little bit about what motivated me to work on this app. So I spent a number of years working with kids on the spectrum in a clinical setting. And I always remember this one kid I worked with whose name was Ben. And Ben um, was a kid who had a lot of trouble with social skills, but at the same time, um, was extremely socially motivated. So he really wanted to engage with kids and he would try to do that quite regularly and oftentimes he would have a lot of trouble in making friends and having successful interactions. He did a number of things that uh, you know we don't think about but they got him into trouble. Things like not really looking at the face of the person he's talking about and sort of looking around the room like this. And he tended to stand too close to kids. That made some of them uncomfortable when he was trying to have a conversation with them. And he always brought the subject back to Power Rangers for some reason. He really liked <laughs> Power Rangers and everything went to Power Rangers. Now. Um, these issues with social skills are a problem for Ben, but they're also a problem for a large number of other children um, with autism spectrum disorders. And we know from the research that the prevalence of autism spectrum disorders and the diagnosis has just gone up in recent years. It's currently as high as 1 in 88. So there's a large number of kids who really um, struggle with social skills deficits. We know that um, this is true in ASD. Um, regardless of cognitive or language ability. And we also know that um, social skills deficits contribute to academic underachievement, anxiety, increased risk of social, social isolation, which is a risk for depression. And so it's a really serious um, area that deserves um, some real focus. So current social skills interventions typically look like this. Um, it's usually done in a small group setting. Uh, five to eight kids with one therapist, uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half a week. Um, focuses on social pragmatics, teaching things like how to make eye contact, how to have give and take in a conversation. And we know that there are things that are helpful in doing this. We know from the research that it's helpful in addition to these sessions to have uh, practice uh, trying out these skills in a natural environment outside of the sessions. And we know that video and audio are valuable teaching tools. Um, but there's a problem. And the problem is that um, the research tells us that actually an hour a week is really not enough to get noticeable gains in terms of social skills. Um, and unfortunately, that's currently what most kids are able to receive. Uh, and moreover, if you ask a therapist who works with kids on the spectrum on social skills, they'll tell you what they really want is not to see the kid this hour a week in this you know sort of unique group setting. They really want to see the kid at school and at home and on the playground. They want to see what it really looks like when the kid's actually running into trouble in real social interactions in as natural setting as possible. So from this realization is sort of where the social lens idea was born for us. So um, we realized we could use Google Glass to capture point of view video of social interactions. Um, we realized that we could use it to allow therapists to quickly view videos from the point of view of the child and to provide timely feedback. And finally, that we could use this to provide a rich longitudinal record. So um, the model here is really designed to amplify existing social skills interventions. So instead of just getting uh, an hour a week of instruction with a therapist, now it's possible with Social Lens to also um, give this child a homework assignment, have them collect uh, point of view video of social interactions, submit this um, sort of for this homework, get feedback between sessions from a therapist, and then the therapist can use all the videos that have been collected there uh, to really inform the teaching that she's doing with the group and to use those directly as a teaching tool. So Dakota's going to tell you a little bit about what that might look like in practice. So in some of these weekly therapy sessions, therapists may choose to focus in on building a two-way conversation with the children in which they get the children to model eye contact with one another, practice speaking in different turns, and also asking questions that are socially appropriate for the situation they're in. So taking this method, a therapist would then go about creating a challenge. So this you can kind of see the web interface of creating a video, um, video conversation challenge. So the therapist would create the challenge, send it to the Google Glass device. The child would then have the, dis the display show the new challenge, and then complete the challenge and send it back to the server for the, uh, the therapist to give feedback. 
And this kind of enables them to really get out there and practice in their daily life and really experiment with these two-way conversations. So some of the feedback generated by the therapist can, would look like this. Um, they have the ability to either approve a social interaction as appropriate or say, this doesn't quite right, try again. And the comment feature really enables them to say, great job, this is obviously working for you. Or, well, it looks like something didn't go right here, maybe we can address it in our next therapy session and really figure out what's not working and what we can do about it. And the unique affordance of Social Lens is that it enables video capture. So you can actually bring the videos into the therapy sessions and really get a feedback on what the child was thinking at the time that they executed these social interactions and like why may it not have worked here and why did you do this and like really figure out what's going on. It's a lot easier to figure out what someone's doing if you can really ask them about it. And then another aspect of Social Lens we developed was a FaceTime scoring mechanism, which um, collaborates with sociometric data to really capture how much time a person's face is in the child's fa field of view. It's utilizing calculations from the Google Glass camera. So you can really see longitudinally how long a person's face is in the video. Um, so how do we get to Social Lens? It was a development process involving a lot of prototyping. We did uh, both paper prototyping with cards, so we could kind of get the flow down and figure out which steps were unnecessary. And then we moved on to digital prototyping where we could really incorporate some of the technological aspects. A lot of the feedback we got were figuring out new challenges and also removing unnecessary steps in the process. So what makes Social Lens unique? Um, it utilizes the point of view video camera of Google Glass, which is a unique affordance of glass and it really enables us to capture social interactions and then give appropriate feedback from a therapist on these so you can really tailor a program specifically to a child. It also utilizes a game model so it's fun to play for the kids and children on the spectrum really do benefit from dire goal directed behaviors. And it also the automatic scoring feature of the FaceTime interaction really enables us to show longitudinal data. So what's the bottom line? Social Lens is an app built around supporting social skill development in children on the spectrum in a way that's fun and also is a great tool for providing feedback and facilitating interactions to tailor a program specific to a children. And it's all about social <coughs> intervention. Now so yeah, so Social Lens is all about seeing, so we're gonna do a little bit of a demo for you. Alright, so first I just wanna, we wanna give you an overview of the website that the Game Master, which, who are the therapists or parents, um, is seeing. So you have the interface here, which is the challenge description. Um, they can add a challenge by doing this. And the interface, they can create challenge, um, description, everything they want. And they also have users, which are the students. It was loading. Um, here we've created some user so you can see kind of um, what statistics, what kind of information is here. So the QR code here is for the user to, um, with a glass, to look at, to register themselves into the system. Um, and you can also see what kind of, yep, sorry, what kind of challenge um, the user is working on right now. And now we're gonna use show you Assuming that this is the challenge that is sent to the user, um, we're going to go through each step that the user is also going to go through when um, they receive and check for a challenge. And since we can't hear the audio I, um, and take our word for it, yeah, you can kind of hear every instruction is read aloud to the user, so you, they don't have to attend to the text that's on the screen. But we have both channels just to make sure that they understand. Um, so here on the welcome screen, you can see that the user is instructed to tap to move ahead. And then they are read um, each step of the instruction. Um, it's, as you can see here, you can tap to move ahead, slide forward to repeat the directions, slide backward to restart the app, or slide down to set up the QR code, um, which I showed before. And we're just going to show you what it looks like without really doing it, because we already created a user. So um. basically here, I would just slide down again 
and it would take me to the uh, screen where I can just tap. And while I'm looking at the QR code on the screen or print it out, just as an example, if you printed one out, you could have the kids look at that or the teacher could do it. And it takes a picture, reads the QR code, and sets up that class to represent the user that the teacher created on the website for that kid. Okay, and so now the user will go ahead and check for a new challenge. Um, the app will pull the information from the server, um, which is on a website here as displayed. And they have a new challenge, so the user will tap to go ahead. And as you can see, the challenge is displayed and also is being read to the user. For example, this challenge is a two-way conversation. And there are tips for the users, for example, to ask questions, to tell stories, make comments, and make eye contact. And then they can go ahead and um, tap to record a video. And we're going to record a short video, for example. Oliver, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Joe. How are you? I'm hanging in there. That's good. Well, how's, I, how's the end of your semester going? Oh, it's going awesome. That's good. OK, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that was an excellent interaction. Um, <laughs> But for some reason, um, if the user wants to try again, they can also swipe down, which is the typical interaction in the camera app, to redo the video. So we're going to redo a very short video. Hi, Nhi. I like Hi. you better. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to stop recording that. And um, now we're going to submit this video onto the server to complete the challenge. And while we wait for that video to upload, I'm going to show you what it looks like on the interface. So we already uploaded an example video here. And as you can see, um, the, the video is already approved by the Game Master before. Um, this was a video for practice. And you can either um, delete the video or just keep it there. Um, we also have other so for this challenge, you can see, I don't know if you can see it right there, you have, if you hover over the icon of the face, you can also see the FaceTime scoring. So this video doesn't have any face in it, it was rejected. Um, this video, however, can we see it? Oh, I see. But yeah, so for each user and each challenge, you can see they're scoring. Um, so for example, for this video, the face scoring is 65% because there's actually some face in it. Um, is it uploaded? Yeah, it's uploaded. So yeah, as you can see, there's face in it, so that's why the FaceTime scoring is 65%. So this is taking a while right now. Yeah, so this relies on the internet. So if the internet is not fast, um, it's going to have a lag. But um, one, st sorry, one step that we also uh, we couldn't show you because of the audio can't be broadcast is that um, when a user submit a challenge, the app tells them to um, wait and come back to check later for notifications. So the user doesn't have to just wait there for feedback, but they can just go do other things. And um, when they return to the app in several, several days later, they will see the feedback from the game master um, and whether the challenge is approved or rejected. While we're, do while we're waiting for the upload to complete, I can show you one of the things you can look at um, is Joe's sort of history of video submissions over time. We can see, um, you know, a recent one from a couple hours ago, it got a good FaceTime score of 66. This here was, uh, this was just a video of Joe checking the mail. So I think maybe either, either he did that by accident or maybe he didn't understand the challenge. Um, um, the, the mail, there was no mailman, so it was just no, no faces in that video. And then we can see as we go back, we've got different numbers. And so this, lets you look at, over a longer period of time, how things are changing. And this is one metric that we've used, but um, obviously we would envision adding additional types of metrics, including some that might be added uh, you know, annotated by the therapists themselves, just to enable sort of long-term tracking. And you always have the videos to go back and look at.
So, it's still uploading for some reason. So once it does upload, what's going to happen is that basically the server here is going to receive the uh, video. It's going to make it available for the uh, therapist to read, but it's also going to send it off to a separate server that we've set up that does the FaceTime processing. And so that will happen, be kicked off right away. And um, on videos like this, we found that it's actually pretty quick to process and um, annotate that. But um, so that, does that score a percentage of time that something like opens exactly what it does. Um, that's precisely what it does. Let's see so we can take questions here. right now. Um, yeah. And, if we, and like after the video is uploaded, it's very straightforward. It's just either approved or rejected. Uh, that's, not, that's not much else. Yeah. Um, so earlier today, uh, Oliver and I came in here and it took like less than two minutes to upload. So I don't know what's going on with it right now. If the I can show you what 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 this would look what this looks like essentially is this is what a video that's just been uploaded looks like. So I can go ahead and watch it. Um, I can make it full screen if I wanted to. And then once I've seen enough, what I'm going to do is in this case approve it, and then I'm going to add a comment. So I'm going to say you know, nice job. And the comment will also appear on the class interface when a user checks the challenge. Right, and then this also be read to them. this appears there. I can check back on my comment in the. FaceTime score and also see that in the other pieces there. So we'll take some questions and we'll uh, see if this finishes uploading or if uh, they've moved some sort of large block of lead between us and the cellular <laughs> network in the time since we tested this. It's a very interesting idea. I'm, I'm wondering if you've thought about the um, possibility of using it for continuous monitoring, assuming in the future everybody's wearing Google Glass throughout the day and being able to have an understanding of context when a person is in conversation, maintaining eye contact, and automatically measuring the quality of the conversation. I think that would be fantastic. And that's definitely sort of what our, that would be our long-term vision. And I think what uh, anybody who's worked with these kids would want is to really be able to see the world through their eyes and then ideally, you know, potentially provide coaching and feedback again in real time. So we see this as a stepping stone towards trying to close that loop, but with an understanding that, uh, you know, uh, the closer we can get to the, what you're describing, I think the better off we'll be. Could I um, also respond to that? I think, too, one of the things that um, could be really interesting with an app like this with kids would be to have them doing challenges simultaneously with each other where they were both seeing each other's point of view or from the teacher's perspective they get both sides of that conversation because that'll really help you see what was going on from both people's perspective during an interaction. Well, related to that, I don't know how practical this would be, but to have the uh, interlocutor, the other kid, great, great satisfaction essentially of the conversation. I think that would be really cool, and we're actually very, because of the sort of uh, constraints of only having a single glass unit and, you know, time, we, di we didn't get a chance to really practice this, but one of the things that would be really interesting is actually to also have in-class exercises that were done where both participants were wearing glass, and then you would actually get both sides of a conversation, and it would be really interesting to have kids reflect on that, and also to have a way to really view both of those simultaneously and look at that, and I think that would be a really valuable teaching tool for working, you know, with a group of kids and showing them something from both perspectives and having them work those things through. I think that'd be really cool. Been waiting a long time. <laughs> Sorry. That was really interesting and uh, made me think about Thank a lot you. of things, particularly perspective taking. So, um, I just you all you may have read this book, The Reason I Jump. You know that one? It's written by. I'm actually not familiar with that one. Autistic man in Japan talking about here's how I see the world, or chapter by chapter by chapter. So, just thinking about um, helping others see how somebody might see yes. the world and how you could use it to do that with you. One of the questions I had for you was on the four tips that you had. Um, I wondered your thoughts about including all of those at once as opposed to working on kind of a behavior at a time. So yeah. I no, that's a re that's a really good point. So the the um, design that we envision here is really that somebody um, who is the therapist who knows the kid really well, who's working with them, um, is going to assign the challenges. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to make it. 
um, fairly open-ended in terms of what you could set up as a challenge um, is because I totally agree. We did this as an example because we wanted to show people the kinds of things that um, a kid could be working on. But if it was me working with you know the kids that I worked with, I probably would have focused on one of those skills at a time and then maybe eventually rolled those up to more sophisticated challenges that were asking them to pay attention to more than one sort of behavior uh, at a time and would also probably gradually increase sort of the length of interactions that I was having them do. And so the idea is to make something flexible enough so that we're not constraining therapists, we're allowing them to use one of the variety of social skills curriculums that are out there or their own clinical judgment in terms of what they want to work on with kids, but using this as an interface that facilitates sort of the um, getting the, you know, closing the information loop so that they're really getting clear feedback about how the kids are applying it outside of class rather than just hearing, you know, sort of parent report of, yes, so-and-so did his homework. <laughs> um, but that's a really good point. Just one last thought. Um, so I'm actually a clinical psychologist, and one of the classes I teach here at Northeastern is called Clinical Skills, and I teach it to people who want to be therapists. Mm -hmm. And so our final assignment is for them to videotape themselves in interaction with a pretend client, and then we come back together in class and watch the video together. It's awful. They, they, they're like this. <laughs> so, but it gives them the opportunity to see in very close, um, you know, watch their interactions and stopping the videotape and seeing, did you see where you just looked away from the client or did you see how you just looked at your watch to see if the session was over? So I wonder about doing that kind of um, almost, you know, minute by minute, second by second look to try to help people really see themselves looking <coughs> away or uh, interrupting somebody or whatever it might be. So any thoughts about that? Sounds like a great class. I'd like to take that class. Um, I think that uh, that's exactly what we have in mind. So the, the sort of idea here, you know, uh, if, if there's four steps that we mentioned, it's, it is very much, uh, you know, you, you go over something in the group setting, you send them home to do this video, you bring them, you, you give them some feedback while they're, you know, working on that during the week, and then you bring them back and you actually look at those videos together with them, and you do go over them in just that kind of detail, and you talk about it. And the idea is hopefully by making this a regular part of instruction that it will sort of um, desensitize kids uh, to doing this. And in some ways, I suspect that compare, you know, younger kids and kids on the spectrum, in my experience, may be less sensitive to looking at those, particularly we're assuming we have a therapist who, of course, is creating a safe environment for that, too. But I think that's really great. And I, I you know, um, I certainly think it will be interesting to look back over the video of this presentation and do the same thing. <laughs> so, um, so I think the direction is great. I'm not sure that, that this particular solution solves the problem that you stated at the outset, which is that um, kids are limited to, to one hour of therapy a week, and presumably the, the limiting factor is the therapist's time, and now you, you not only want this hour session, but you want the therapist to spend hours watching video and reading it. So, so maybe a workflow is the therapist gives the, the homework assignment and some rating instructions for the parent who can go off. We, th we thought about that, and there's no reason that this wouldn't support that um, just as well. I think um, my hope is also that uh, many of the therapists that I've worked with, um, you know, the issue has to do with scheduling in some ways as much as it has to do with, uh, you know, money and, you know, the time that they have available. Because you have these kids, you have to, you know, they are oftentimes seeing three or four other specialists for other, you know, um, you know, areas that they need help in. And so my hope was that we would be able to capitalize on sort of some of the downtime between sessions and other things. But one of the things we want to do next semester is really try to get feedback from people who practice in this area as to how much time they could do and try out things. Like I think the parent idea would be really great. And I love the uh, image of getting parents as involved in sort of the process and understanding what their kids are working on because the, that's going to be really key to having them support kids in their development. Um, and that's going to be an important part of this, too. So thank you. That's a great idea. That also got me thinking about other people who could use this. So, so you've got store and forward, and eventually, let's say, you're going to have continuous, real-time kind of piping in, mm -hmm. kind of plug in the ear, and I can see what you're doing. So I could imagine, I mean, you're always going to have more kids with autism, and then you're going to have diagnosticians, clinicians, and special educators to, to identify and support them. So you could also, potentially, maybe you guys talked about this, think about being able to see what a parent is saying in the home, and the diagnostician could be asking them to engage in certain activities that may show whether they're at higher or lower risk, or make suggestions for how they might interact with their child in the, in, that may 
produce a better result, or a, a psychologist, special educator observing a child in a classroom and being able to document that and share that with somebody at a distance. So this is very much child focused, and I realize that it's sort of not real time. But once you get up to real time, I think having both the child gain from this directly, a parent engage with the system and, and benefit directly, and a, a, you get all stakeholders using this yeah. for slightly different purposes, all with the intention of understanding and better supporting that kid, I guess that this would sort of penetrate the ecosystem. And I think that would be wonderful. And I think also one of the ideas that we have behind sort of trying to create this longitudinal record of a kid's social interactions is that that would be something that would be of high interest to share with other professionals who are working with the kid, to share with parents, to use as something to show the kid themselves so that they can look and reflect on their behavior and how their own behaviors changed as a means of, you know, helping them sort of own their success and the, and the progress that they're making. So I I. I I think that would be fantastic, and my hope is that as Google Glass expands and becomes cheaper and more available, that we'll be able to expand um, into those types of uses more and more.